Well, good evening. I would like to call to order the regular meeting of the Newport News School Board for Tuesday, October the 19th, 2021. On behalf of the members of the board and the superintendent, I welcome each of you present and watching. A quorum is present to transact the business of the school division. Uh, Mr. Harris uh, wanted to inform everyone that he was unable to make it tonight due to his uh, military, temporary military duties. Uh, and we do have a board member who wishes to participate in our meeting electronically. Uh, as indicated in pol board policy BEE, electronic participation in meetings from remote location, the board member must, uh, be pre uh, must make such a request, cite the reason for remote attendance, and the board must approve the request by majority vote of the members present. School board member Terry Best has made such a request and we would like to uh, uh, give Dr. Best a chance to hear from her now. Dr. Best. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I respectfully make it a request to participate in the meeting remotely due to the fact that I am currently medically quarantined. Thank you, Dr. Best. Any questions from the board? There, there being none, is there a motion uh, to allow Dr. Best to participate remotely? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we have Dr. Best join us remotely for this meeting. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Any further discussion? There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Hunter? Four. Mrs. Searles Law? Four. Mrs. Amon? Four. Mr. Ely? Four. Mr. Brown? Four. Motion carry, 5 0. All right. As well, um, our student representative, uh, Ms. Patterson, has asked to be excused from tonight's meeting. She is attending a volleyball game, which is uh, some important um, business to be sure. So we wish uh, her and the Woodside team uh, Godspeed on their game. All right. With the uh, COVID-19 pandemic and now the Delta variant, uh, they continue to affect how we conduct our business. Personal barriers are installed uh, between members of the board and our staff and visitors are masked and socially distanced here in the auditorium and in our overflow areas. We're taking these steps to ensure the health and well-being of our staff and the public we value and appreciate your partnership. We will begin tonight's meeting with an invocation and a pledge to the flag. Here to do honors are two students from Gildersleeve Middle School, Hazel Benoit and Chase Murray. Please come forward. First, Hazel, please come forward and deliver the invocation. Good evening, Chairman Brown, Dr. Parker, and school board members. I'm Hazel Benoit, and I'm an eighth grade student at Gildersleeve Middle School. Tonight, I'd like to share with you a piece I wrote inspired by our school motto, SOAR. SOAR, dream, make your goals, work for them. Learn what you can at any given moment so that one day you'll be there. Soaring high above the clouds, wings outstretched, looking at how far you made it from the ground. After falling down countless times, after feeling like you can't do it, but you've made it past that. These wings that you've earned have been built from strenuous days and dark nights. These wings, through hard work and determination, they have been built from the ground up. Soar proudly and inspire those around you too as well. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Chase Murray, would you please come forward? Tell us a little bit about yourself and then lead us in the pledge. Good evening, members of the school board. I am Chase Murray, an eighth grader at Gildersleeve Middle School. I am an honor roll tag student. I am a member of Six Mount Zion Baptist Temple. I am the president of the. Um, I'm sorry. I'm the president of the youth council for Baptist Temple, and I am. I have been to male minority meeting before and I've been to talk to you guys before and um, <laughs> <laughs> please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You all did a wonderful job uh, supporting Hazel and Chase tonight, our members of their school, of their family and their school family. I would like to uh, give them an the opportunity now to stand and be recognized. The board appreciates the encouragement you have given these students and we thank you for bringing them here to tonight's meeting. All right. 
the next item on, on tonight's agenda are going to be our school board recognitions. And Dr. Parker, I believe we have a few. Let's get a few recognitions. We'll start with our um, communications awards. Yes, yes, sir. We're going to change the order up a little bit. Good evening. It's always a pleasure to share good news. Maintaining open communication and keeping our community informed are two important objectives of Newport News Public Schools Strategic Plan Journey 2025. Our first honorees this evening are responsible for ensuring that our community is well informed. Each year, the National School Public Relations Association recognizes outstanding education communications through its publications and digital media excellence awards program. During this year's awards program, our community relations team received eight awards. The Return to Learn Weekly earned an award of excellence for internal newsletters. The Journey 2025 booklet won an award of merit in branding and packaging. The NNPS Heroes column, published in the Oyster Pointer, earned an award of merit in writing. The Return to Learn Plan Handbook earned an award of merit. Our website earned an award of merit. And in social media, the Teacher of the Year campaign earned an award of excellence, and our Facebook Live events and the Black History campaign earned awards of merit. So please join me this evening in congratulating the members of the Community Relations Team. Heading that team is Michelle Price, our Director of Community Relations. <laughs> Leading the team also, Ms. Kelly Slusher, Coordinator of Community Relations and Graphic Design. Laura Jennings, Coordinator of Web Services. Carrie Albertson, Community Relations Specialist and Writer. Matt Thomas, our Web Applications Developer. And Christine Rock, our Web Content Developer, who was unable to join us this evening. This dynamic team supports all schools and offices and has been instrumental in keeping our family, staff, and the community informed. They're responsible for coordinating and managing the school division's communications, marketing, and public relations efforts. So thank you again and congratulations. Thank you again, and I appreciate my colleague for filling in for me this evening. <laughs> I have the honor of presenting the next recognition. Training and development are top priorities for the Newport News School Board. As part of its collective effort to maintain effective leadership, the school board has participated in numerous development programs, conferences, and workshops through the Virginia School Boards Association and the National School Boards Association. 
This evening, our own school board members are receiving their own awards for their dedication to advancing their expertise from the Virginia School Boards Association. The VSBA Academy provides training in effective leadership and governance to school board members and support staff. Each year, VSBA recognizes board members for their dedication to improving their skills through conferences on leadership, school laws, strategic planning, and legislative issues. Each of the persons being recognized this evening has received a certificate from the VSBA. These awards honor their participation in the Academy's programs for the past two years. Chairman Douglas Brown, Vice Chairman Searles Law, and Dr. Terry Bess earned the Award of Honor. Board member Gary Hunter earned the Award of Excellence. Board members John Ely and Marvin Harris earned the Award of Achievement. And Rebecca Amen is acknowledged for her participation. Let's give our board members a round of applause. Each of these dedicated public servants have received their certificates and distinctive lapel pins to symbolize their commitment to effective school board governance through participation in the academy. So on behalf of the students, staff, and citizens of Newport News, we thank you for your dedication and leadership of this school division and congratulate you on your awards. Thank you, and again, congratulations uh, to all of tonight's honorees. At this time, we'll take a five-minute break so that our honorees and their families may leave if they choose to do so. During this time, our viewing audience will have an opportunity to view this month's school board spotlight. So we'll stand in recess for about five minutes. Thank you. Even through a global pandemic and unique learning situations, the 2021 senior class rose above these challenges to reach a monumental milestone. The class of 2021 increased Newport News Public Schools graduation rate to 94.5%, significant growth from 72.9% in 2008. In the same 15 year time span, the dropout rate decreased from 12% to only 1.4%. This places NNPS's on-time graduation rate above the state average of 93% and the dropout rate below the Commonwealth's average of 4.3%. A closer look at the numbers shows that every student subgroup in Newport News, including ethnic groups, students with disabilities, economically disadvantaged students, and English learners is better than the state average in both graduation and dropout rates. And almost half of the 2021 graduating class went above and beyond, with 45% of graduating seniors earning an advanced diploma. So what's the secret to success for Newport News Public Schools? Since 2008, educators have implemented a national award-winning dropout prevention and recovery program. Combine this with online courses, summer learning opportunities, community mentors, dedicated graduation coaches, and college credit courses, and you have a recipe for continued improvements as more students graduate college, career, and citizen ready in Newport News Public Schools. Just a day after fear gripped Heritage High and Huntington Middle Schools, a community came together to blanket the schools, students, and educators with prayer and love. Following the traumatic shooting last Monday, the Southeast Community Coalition, a unified network of churches and pastors, organized a community prayer event in front of the school. A caring community of school staff, students, families, city officials, elected leaders, and first responders gathered outside to allow faith and unity to triumph over fear and violence. Together, a community prayed for healing, safety in our schools, guidance for our leaders, strength for our educators, 
and the resiliency to overcome this tragic incident. Heritage Principal Dr. Erling Hunter thanked the community for their outpouring of support and asked them to continue caring for the students, staff, and families as they cope with the psychological aftermath. With Huntington Middle School housed in the same building, Principal Ebony Griffin, who is a Heritage graduate herself, fully realized that it will take a village of community partners and dedicated parents to support and care for our students moving forward. Already, Newport News Public Schools has established a support hotline for anyone affected to receive counseling and advice from trained specialists. While pastors and community leaders offered prayers covering a myriad of needs, one singular theme consistently shined through. We as a community must love our young people unconditionally, fiercely, and intentionally. Every extra effort is a benefit for our students in Newport News Public Schools. Extra time for reading, extra help devoted to individual students, or extra supplies to enhance classroom instruction. Parents and community members can help supply that extra bit by financially aiding our schools through simple, everyday errands. When you're out shopping, keep your eyes open for box tops for education products. Use the Box Tops app to scan your store receipt and instantly add cash to your children's school. It's that easy and a huge benefit for our schools to receive extra funding and supplies. And while you're shopping, don't forget to use your reward cards in a smart way. Your Food Lion MVP card, Harris Teeter's VIC card, the Kroger Plus card, and other reward programs can be linked directly to the school of your choice. So when you buy everyday products, you're supporting your child's school. To link your reward card, visit the store's customer service desk for more information. Another way to support education is through DonorsChoose.org, which continues to be a wonderful online resource to directly equip classroom instruction. Just like the name implies, generous donors get to choose specifically which projects to fund. Simply visit DonorsChoose.org and type in Newport News Public Schools or a specific school in the search bar to find a project that needs financial support. Donors can fund an entire project or part of a project and can clearly see where every dime is spent. With your monetary donation, our hardworking and dedicated teachers can successfully provide creative and meaningful instruction to all students. Parents, make sure you pay attention to important dates when they're sent home with your child, and then help spread the word. Anyone can attend spirit nights at local restaurants, where a percentage of the purchases go back to the school. Plus, they're fun events for the whole family. And you can help your school form a strong parent-teacher relationship by joining your local PTA. Membership fees alone can help a school with budget needs, and some schools even offer rewards for joining the PTA. PTAs are instrumental at organizing many fundraising efforts, along with seasonal options such as t-shirt sales or holiday craft fairs. Supporting your school is easy. A little bit of extra effort goes a long way to help ensure that our children have the best education possible. With the global pandemic, forcing Newport News students to experience over a year of adjusted learning at home, virtually and through hybrid instruction, the summer of 2021 was a wonderful chance for many students to get back in the classroom for valuable in-person teaching. 3,719 elementary and middle school students spent five weeks this past summer learning, exploring, and creating in a safe setting. The summer program for arts, recreation, and knowledge, better known as SPARK, allowed rising kindergarten through eighth grade students to focus on literacy and mathematics while exploring a number of enrichment opportunities in STEM, fine arts, physical education, and other exciting subjects. For students attending SPARK at 10 schools across the city, transportation to and from each site was provided daily. Each school also offered free breakfast and lunch to fuel a full day of learning. Elementary age students spent part of the day building literacy skills through number talks, interactive reading activities, and collaborative writing groups. 
The other part of the day was focused on experiencing mathematics and science through hands-on STEM activities that made learning come alive. For middle school students attending Spark, the morning classes focused on core instruction in literacy and math, while the afternoon was devoted to expanding students' life experiences through enrichment activities in the arts, physical education, engineering, and robotics. Each week, students rotated to a new enrichment activity, allowing them to dive into five different learning themes during the summer. Community partners such as Jefferson Lab visited the classroom to bring a professional perspective to the themed experiences. And students moved beyond the classroom walls for excursions to various parks on the peninsula, enjoying physical education activities in the great outdoors. In all grades, Spark also offered focused instruction to students with disabilities and English language learners, ensuring all students had access to the knowledge and skills needed to succeed. After a tumultuous year brought on by COVID restrictions, thousands of Newport News Public School students who participated in Spark received the necessary instruction to keep them on pace to advance to the next grade. Spark provided students with additional classroom lessons to ensure mastery in necessary Virginia standards of learning, kept students engaged through creative enrichment activities, and helped prepare students to transition smoothly to the next grade as they stay on track to graduate college, career, and citizen ready. We are honored tonight to have a former school board member uh, and present uh, House of Delegates member, uh, Shelly Simons, in the audience with us. And we have uh, Dr. Vince Bertram, pre President and CEO of Project Lead the Way, who uh, we're honored to have him present an award to Delegate Simons here tonight. So uh, Dr. Bertram, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. First, um, Chairman Brown, and Dr. Parker, to each member of the school board. Thank you for the opportunity to be here as a former urban school superintendent and a member of the Indiana State Board of Education. I greatly admire and appreciate all the work you do. And so thank you for that. Thank you for all you do for our children and the teachers across the district. You know, and Project Lead the Way is the nation's leading provider of STEM education, computer science, biomedical science, and engineering. And for the past 25 years, we have grown schools across the U.S., millions of children, and we're proud to be in your school district. Um, but I'm also here today and honored to uh, present a, a special award. The PLTW Legislator of the Year Award acknowledges and recognizes community leaders in our network of schools who are providing real-world transformative learning experience to ensure students in our schools have the skills they need to thrive throughout their lives be able to take the jobs that are available in our economy and to grow our communities, our regions, and our states. We also know the legislators play a critical role in making our work easier within our schools and creating the policies that allow us to meet the needs of our children. So we think about pre-K-12 educational landscape across the U.S., obviously we know things have changed dramatically. But it's imperative for those who are responsible for making our laws and creating opportunities to prepare students uh, are also recognized. So with that in mind, I'm very excited and proud on behalf of everyone at Project Lead the Way and our thousands of schools to present Delegate Shelley Simons with the PLW Legislator of the Year Award. Shelley. As we know, Shelley's a former educator, school board member, community leader with a passion for excellence in education. She supports the advancement of STEM curriculum and an active voice in education reform. And she served in so many different roles in leadership, providing the leadership we need to advance this work. So Shelley, we thank you on behalf of again, all of us at PLW for your commitment to education, the great work you do, your passion for meeting the needs of our children. So with that, I'd like to present this award to you. <laughs> wow, thank you so much.
wouldn't be so passionate about STEM education at the state level if it weren't for my fellow former school board members and the administration of Newport News Public Schools. Uh, I feel like you, you all have been the thought leaders in Virginia on STEM education, the incubator for all kinds of great ideas. And please know that I'm up in Richmond making sure that the policy of the state of Virginia matches our aspirations for STEM for our kids. So thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Well, during our regular meetings, we provide time for the public to address the board. These opportunities are scheduled in the early part of our agenda and also towards the end of the meeting. The school board recognizes that during the pandemic, some members of the public may not be able to join us in person. As advertised, citizens may submit comments via a web form, email, or voicemail up to 30 minutes prior to the start time of our meeting to be included in the official meeting record. For those of you joining us in person, the board considers this an opportunity to listen to your comments and not respond. Please understand that we will consider your concerns and get back to you at a later time. As you come up, we ask that you uh, comply with our three minute time limit. Once you begin your comments, a green light will come on at the end of the day, it's over here. A yellow light signals that you have 30 seconds remaining and a red light indicates that your time is up. As your name is called, Please come forward. Right, and the first card I have tonight is Carrie Wollen or Carrie Nolan. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Parker, and members of the board. My name is Carrie Nolan. I am a fourth grade teacher here in Newport News. I come before you tonight to ask that the board consider implementing virtual Wednesdays or half day Wednesdays for the teachers. I'm sure I speak for a lot of my fellow colleagues when I say we are getting burnt out already and it is only October. The workload being placed upon us is tremendous. We are working well past our contracted hours. Some examples are late bus duties, conferences, SST paperwork, grading, and planning. We simply do not have enough time for all of this that is expected of us. I realize there are teacher, bus driver, and substitute shortages, but something needs to be done. I'm afraid if something is not done, the situation of shortages may become worse. Other districts throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia have already instituted some of these changes. Why can't we? If you are unable to grant this request, at least consider giving us some type of compensation for the extra hours that we work beyond our contract hours. Thank you for your time. Mr. Nolan, uh, next card I have is Pam Hall. Good evening, my name is Pam Hall. On behalf of the Huntington High School Alumni Association Executive Board, we ask you to stand by your word to keep Huntington Middle School in its current location and reject the proposal to swap the land with the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hall. Next card I have is uh, Ms. Janine Baysmore. Good evening. I'm Danny Baysmore, and most of you are familiar. <laughs> Huntington Middle School's doors are shuttered, boarded, windows and doors all boarded up. The students who had dreams of careers in the arts and the telecommunications are either scattered over the city or being educated in what will become inadequate space in the corridor of Heritage High School. I'm here to remind you that for 10 years, this school board has sought funding from the city council for Huntington Middle School and over and over again being denied. While funding is in the CIP, my opinion is that city officials have required you to agree with a plan for the taking of school property in order to receive funding from the city to rebuild Huntington Middle School. Reject the plan. <laughs> they wanted to do away with Huntington Middle School altogether. This is a statement that was not made by any one of you, but it said, 
the board has some thinking to do about immediate solutions, but the long range solution is to work with the city for a facility on the Huntington site that is a school and or community center with classes, athletic fields, and other community services named for Huntington. So there was a systemic plan to do away with Huntington forever. But thanks to most of you, Huntington is alive, but it's not well. Thank you, thanks to you, you made a commitment to replace Huntington in the current location. Remember this document? Some members signed, some of you were not here. Tonight, I ask you to honor your signature. I ask you to honor your word. The city has presented you with a plan that replaces Huntington Middle School with a recreation center and other resource buildings and moves Huntington to lesser space on 28th Street. The mayor says it's a done deal. We say it's not. We have been disenfranchised enough, ignored enough. Our community is not in agreement with the plan that the city has presented. Your funding requests for Huntington have been denied for years. The city knows that there is no, that there is a need for Huntington. The feasibility study said so. They will continue to delay, but ladies and gentlemen, do not accept the plan that has been presented. Honor your commitment. We ask that you reject the plan. Guess what? Huntington shall rise again at 3401 Orchid Avenue. I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Baysmore. Next card I have is Margaret Keeter. So happy to be with you and to sense the commitment from the community uh, to New Purdue's public schools. Even though um, individuals don't always agree with the final decisions of the school board, the fact that uh, community communities are here speaking to you uh, and expressing their concerns and giving you input. Uh, I taught in New Virginia schools, schools many, many years ago for about 10 years. Uh, my daughter graduated in 2001, and one of my grandsons graduated in 2018. Uh, I had not planned to, be, to attend school board meetings again. I thought I was a grandmother and I was done. But I had looked across the state and looked within our own community and realized that uh, all voices need to be heard uh, here. Um, and I just wanted you to know that uh, I truly believe that free public education, quality education, that is offered by New Purdue's public schools and most of the schools in Virginia uh, is a critical part of democracy. And we must talk to each other kindly uh, I'm trying to get my heart around something called loving kindness. Um, and I just wanted to bring that to you uh, here tonight. I'll be back. I probably won't speak uh, again, but I just want you to know that I support New Community Public Schools, taxpayer. My husband said, my husband said, why are you going to the school board meeting? You know, we don't have any children there. And I, I patted him on his arm and I said, it's probably a doctor coming out of here that's going to look after me in about 10 years. <laughs> and it's probably uh, a nurse aide, nurse aide that's going to look after me. Uh, and my great-grandchildren are going to need some care from the school system. So that's why I'm here. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Keeter. Next card I have is <clears throat> Bethany Stevenson. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, I believe that she just spoke. Uh, Miss Mary Boss. Where is she? No, no, no. Oh, Bethany Stevenson's here. Okay. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, had a little bit of a difficult time getting up here. Um, I'm not able to wear a mask, and I made that clear. And I was 
um, met with a lot of difficulty, like some of your staff um, telling me that your policy is that masks are required and there's no exceptions. And um, that's just unacceptable. That's not accommodating. Um, and whether, you know, regardless of what you think about masks, they are a medical tool. And this is my body, and no one has the right to force me to do something to my body, whether it's a mask or a shot or anything. It's my body. So I came here tonight to speak on behalf of Newport News Parents for Freedom. This past week, we witnessed people from all different professions take a stand against medical tyranny and government overreach. Millions of people being fired and forced to quit for not compromising their personal sovereignty, body autonomy, and God-given rights for a paycheck. Imagine having to choose between protecting your family and providing for your family. We cannot guarantee one single person who has received this injection of gene therapy that we are foolishly calling a vaccine will not experience reactions, injuries, or deaths when clinical trials are, cur clinical trials are currently not going until 2023 and all we have is anecdotal evidence that is worth listening to. We should be listening to people and their stories of their real life experiences People are being hurt and killed by this shot, and that is undeniable. Breakthrough infections are incredibly common, and natural immunity proves time and time again to be stronger than synthetic temporary immunity provided with the mRNA gene therapy. We all listened to the president's appeal this last week, claiming that parents can sleep easier knowing their kids are protected soon when the shot is approved for the age group 5 to 11. What he doesn't realize is we are not losing sleep over this. We are not afraid. We are not anxiously awaiting a shot that doesn't protect anyone to be pumped into our healthy children, potentially creating problems where none exist. The current fatality rate for children under 18 is 0.0007%. The CDC's own data shows there has been a total of 513 deaths for children under 18 since this started. We should be thrilled and thankful that children are seemingly unaffected by this virus and stop projecting adults' irrational fears and public health rules on them that are psychologically abusive and teaching them to be afraid of everything. Our kids are scared. They're scared of their friends. They're scared of the air. They're scared of germs. They're scared of everything. And we're not allowing them to play or be healthy by sheltering and sanitizing everything in sight. Our children, we are doing our a great disservice to our children under the guise of their safety, and it is madness. We anticipate there will be pressure on you to require this for students when it gets approved, and we know you are in difficult positions, and no matter what you do, there will be people upset. Thank Remember, you, Ms. Stevenson. I'm sorry? Uh, your, your time has expired, Ms. Stevenson. Oh, okay. you, Go ahead, right. if you want, if you have your last um, sentence, go ahead just, and say your last okay, sentence. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to wrap it up with um, you, I'm sorry, I lost my place. Um, you, you have an opportunity here to stand on the right side of history, and um, I just encourage you to do that. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Uh, next speaker is Miss Mary Voss. Hello, uh, Mary Voss. I'm an NNPS teacher, parent, and graduate. I'm also a proud member of VCOR, um, which is a progressive pro labor caucus of the VEA. First of all, I'd like to express solidarity with Heritage High and Huntington Middle students, families, and staff after the recent shooting. Um, today, my comments are focused on the increasing number of school boards across Virginia that have recently voted to give their employees additional planning time uh, through a combination of virtual days, such as virtual Wednesdays, early dismissal days, such as half-day Wednesdays, or shortened school days in order to support overworked teachers and staff who are working long past our contract hours, often as a result of school division understaffing and additional expectations on educators during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, the educator shortage is at an all-time high, as is teacher and staff burnout, and school workers are putting in longer hours than before we were, while working on the front line of a global pandemic. Uh, for many of us, frontline working conditions means hundreds of people packed into buildings that are often not adequately ventilated, not through fault of y'all, but just from underfunding. Um, and then also we are serving students who often don't wear their masks correctly. And due to the school worker shortage, we're working longer hours with less planning time, um, as many of us are covering additional duties like late bus dismissal 
and serving as a substitute teacher to all or part of the classroom when our coworkers are out sick um, amidst the substitute teacher shortage. Uh, this year, many NNPS workers are also completing mandatory trainings with two to three hours of coursework per week. Um, many of these professional developments are very valuable instructionally. Um, I'm in a really great letters um, training as an um, elementary teacher. It is two to three hours of work each week, you know, in addition to all our other duties. Um, additional virtual days, half days off, or a shortened school day would give teachers and staff sufficient time to complete these important trainings. In intense working conditions like these, teachers and staff deserve additional un unencumbered time to plan, hold parent conferences, and catch up on paperwork. By the way, all of the options I mentioned do fully comply with SB 1303, which is the school reopening bill. Um, here are some excerpts from news articles from Virginia districts across the state that are already giving their teachers and staff some much needed additional planning time. Uh, students within Roanoke County Public Schools will begin to have one early dismissal or closed day each week beginning October 15th. The move is meant to allow teachers time for planning for differentiated learning and remediation, contacting parents, working with individual students, and offsetting time spent covering for other teachers due to a lack of substitutes. Starting in October, Harrisonburg City Public School students will have their school day shortened by one hour after a unanimous, unanimous vote by the school board. Their chief academic officer said the shortened school day addresses current challenges the division is facing, like increasing COVID-19 cases among teachers. Uh, thank you for your time. Please consider giving some teachers some unencumbered planning time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Boss. <laughs> Next speaker is Valerie Fashion. Good evening, um, Mr. Chairman Brown and Mr. Parker and board members. My name is Valerie Fashion, and I'm here today speaking today as an advocate for my grandson and the thousands of Newport News public school students that are being left behind educationally because of the reading, spelling, and math curriculums currently being used. Students are struggling on the elementary, middle, and high school levels. Elementary students are not given any spelling words to study, yet they are required to pass a PALS spelling test with words they have not studied, cannot pronounce, or have not seen in their lifetime. The Eureka Math curriculum equates mathematical concepts to stories and focuses on the process instead of the answer. Math is about getting the correct answer. Math answers have to be exact. How do you focus on the process when working in a bank, a grocery store, or for NASA? These businesses require you to be exact when dealing with money and solving scientific problems. The book and the movie Hidden Figures shows Katherine Johnson working on mathematical equations, trying to figure out an exact outcome. She focused on getting an exact answer. Thousands of students in elementary, middle, and high school from the news public schools are below the grade level. Many students do not know their last name, they can't write their last name, and they ask why they have to write their last name. They're not on the reading level, they can't spell sight words correctly, some of them can't count money, they don't know the multiplication tables, their handwriting is unreadable, they can't sign their name in cursive, and they cannot tell time using a regular clock. How can the students do the vision problems and fractions if they don't know the multiplication table. Also, critical race theory is not being taught at any public schools in the United States or Virginia. You cannot teach what you don't know. Critical race theory is only taught in law schools. This is a method of study for legal scholars. Critical race theory was a movement initially started at Harvard University under Professor Derrick Bell in the 1980s. Other than a few months ago, no one ever heard of critical race theory before it was brought up as a political issue. Stop playing around with this non-issue and focus and concentrate on educating our students. It is our responsibility to prepare them for the future. What happened to the textbooks? Everybody's just using a bunch of papers. Education is the new currency of the 21st century. How will the Newport News School District address the below grade level issues of our students? What are the guidelines for helping the students get on grade level. The curriculum committee should involve your school teachers in selecting a user-friendly 
curriculum for our students. How's a new Eureka curriculum uh, 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 offer? Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Ms. Fashion. Next speaker is James Lovett. Good afternoon, school board and uh, Dr. Parker and school board members. Uh, I like to take my mask down because sometimes my words don't come out clear with this mask. Okay, okay. okay I have uh, two issues that I want to speak to the school board about. Um, one issue is about um, rejecting the plan, which is planned by the uh, city council, to uh, put uh, Hydro Middle School on 28th and Orchid Avenue. I hope you guys reject that. Um, the other thing is, I uh, spoke to you all a couple months ago about um, using the uh, gymnasium in the elementary schools. Uh, when I was coming up back in the 60s, we uh, used uh, Magruder Recreation Center, which was Magruder uh, Gymnasium, but they called it Magruder Recreation Center. Okay, And the, the city got involved, they paid uh, people to work the, uh, the recreation center, okay, and it helped a lot of us from getting in trouble. You know, we played basketball, volleyball, you know, all, any type of indoor sports activities, uh, arts and craft. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Joe, Joe, um, oh yeah, last name, last name, but Joe, his wife worked at arts and crafts uh, at uh, Magruder Recreation Center. Um, I reject the plan which the city council has proposed to you all of placing Huntington Middle School on 20 East Street and Orchard Avenue. Huntington Middle School should be torn down and rebuilt on 341 Orchard Avenue. Um, is there anything in the works or on your agenda to help decrease crime in the Southeast Community District which the school board can get involved in? If not, I'm requesting that the STEM Academy and Achieve a Dream Elementary School, Booker T Elementary, John Marshall, and uh, Newsom Park Elementary Schools Gymnasium uh, be utilized in the afternoon from 4.30 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. as an outlet for the young teenagers to participate in the recreational activities in Austin Craft. Back in the day, former Magruder Elementary School was known as Magruder Recreation Center. The, that uh, recreation center kept many young teenagers in that part of the Southeast community from getting into trouble with the law. The project could be in conjunction with the New Canoes City Council Parks and Recreation Department. Please consider this proposal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lovell. Thank you. Madam Clerk, I believe that was my last card. Are there any additional cards? There being no additional cards, uh, we do have another opportunity near the end of our meeting for the public to address the board again. We want to thank you for your comments this evening. We will now move on to section three, the consent agenda, which includes 3.01 minutes from the work session on September 21, 21, September 21, 2021, 3.02 minutes from the regular session meeting on September 21, 2021, 3.03 minutes from the special meeting on September 21, 2021, 3.04 special closed session on October 5th, 2021, 3.05 special meeting October 5th, 2021. 3.06 financial reports, including the revenue report for September 2021, the expense report for September 2021, child nutrition reports for September 2021. 3.07, the personnel report, 3.08, budget transfer, 3.09, appointments of agents of the board. At this time, may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as read? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Hunter. Any discussion? There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Four. Mrs. Searles Law. Four. Mrs. Amon. Four. Dr. Best. Four. Mr. Ely. Four. Mr. Brown. Four. Motion carries six zero. We did have uh, the superintendent did make a personnel recommendation this evening, and so uh, do we have a motion tonight to approve the superintendent's personnel recommendation? 
Uh, yes, we do. Um, we have a motion to approve the superintendent's personnel recommendation for Ms. Monique Hampton for Newport News Education Foundation Director. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Ely. Any discussion? There being none, Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Hunter. Four. Mrs. Searles Law. Four. Mrs. Amon. Four. Dr. Best. Four. Mr. Ely. Four. Mr. Brown. Four. Motion carries 6 0. Uh, let's congratulate Ms. All right. So, so uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd li like to introduce uh, Monique Hampton as the Newport News Edu uh, Education Foundation Director incoming. Monique, would you please stand? And welcome this evening and uh, welcome to, to the Newport News uh, family here. I'll read your bio and uh, then if you have any family or friends here, you can introduce them as well. Uh, Ms. Hampton has a bachelor's degree of science uh, from Virginia State University and continuing education studies in leadership and organizational behaviors and economics from Grand Canyon University. Uh, Mrs. Hammond worked as the development assistant for health sciences, health sciences advancement philanthropy in San, San Diego, California, the associate director of donor relations and stewardship for DePaul University in Chicago, Illinois, and she currently is the founder and consultant for Hope Urban Gardens Project, um, the brainchild organization Simply Justice for the States of Arizona, Georgia, Maryland, Illinois, California, and Virginia. So she is a very busy lady and has started her own philanthropic um, endeavors. Uh, and we welcome her to the Newport News family at this time. So uh, Ms. Hampton, welcome aboard and uh, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> at this time, if you've brought any family or friends you'd like to introduce, please do so at this time. Absolutely. Should I do it from here or from the podium? You're welcome to do it from there, ma'am. We can hear you. and creating a space where education has always been the most important priority in our family. All the way from the lunchroom to the boardroom, she was involved in my education from K through 12 and beyond. And she's here to support me today as I move my career to a space that is truly um, important and special to me, which is connecting, partnering with students, families, and the community in our hope to become advocates for our students in school and and more importantly to connect the business community and the families who are responsible for hurting our children through their education process and I could be more happy and more honored to be the foundation director because it is my passion uh, to be able to create funds uh, to create programs and to steward our students and our families and our community in their in, the, in our students education career I know one thing that really captivated me when I had a chance to meet with Dr. Parker and the wonderful individuals within the Education Foundation and on the school board, it was their passion for partnering with and connecting people. And our students in the Newport New School District don't deserve anything but the best. They may not know how to get to their dreams, they may not know who can help them, but they know what it is. They know what it is that drives them in their education. And it's our job and our duty to be able to help steward them and herd them through that process, to get them involved with the community that they one day will be a part of, a productive part of, and to make sure that they're involved in their education in a way that helps them grow, helps them partner with not only their peers, but helps them connect with the community that they will become a part of. And the strategic plan that Dr. Parker put together that states that the big vision and the mission is to make the students career ready, citizen ready, and, and, and college ready, I think is an, it's a wonderful vision. Um, it's one that I caught immediately when I read it. It's one that connected to me personally when I had the chance to hear about it from the board and the Education Foundation. And the work that the foundation does really truly just makes my heart beat. So it's my, it's my goal to make sure that it makes everyone involved with all of our students here in Newport News, that makes their heart beat as well. And it helps them create the best outcomes that they can. And it helps us to be able to have all the resources that we need to make 
make sure that they do so. So thank you for having me. Thank you for appointing me. I am honored to be here, and I can't wait to get started and do the good work. And I'm sure you will, because you have a great, uh, great background. We're looking forward to the work of, um, in your capacity as the director. And our Education Foundation needs innovation and a shot in the arm to, to get us going. So thank you for joining our team, and thank you for uh, coming this evening. And that, that concludes the appointments for this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dr. Parker. The next item on our agenda is now Section 4, which uh, brings us to our action items. Uh, the first is 4.01, our proposed capital improvement plan. And uh, Dr. Parker, you have a presentation for our tour vote. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sorensen will come back up. He uh, presented the capital budget to the board at the last board meeting, and uh, he will be here to answer any questions the board may have uh, prior to considering a vote of approval. Thank you, Dr. Parker. Good afternoon, or good evening, rather, uh, Mr. Brown, members of the board. I'm going to walk through the 2023 CIP. It is the same plan that you saw previously, as Dr. Parker pointed out. Just want to walk through it real quick because we are asking for your approval on it this evening. So this is the worksheet that uh, hopefully looks familiar to you. Um, so let me walk through this real quick. So in the left-hand column is the project type with a project name. And then there are five years working from left to right, 23 through 27. Those are the fiscal years. And there's a dollar amount representing the estimated cost of each project going, going across. Five years, of course, it is a five-year plan. Uh, 2023, the first year, is the only year in which the city will appropriate funds for projects. So if I could just walk down that uh, rather quickly, and I, of course, I'll answer any questions you guys have. The top third of the worksheet is really what we call our capital maintenance um, projects. It's HVAC, roof projects, and paving. Through the course of five years, there are six HVAC projects nine roofing projects and seven paving projects over five years we're requesting 50 point or estimating 50.2 million dollars and in the first year is 12.5 million dollars in the middle the next third if you will is our renovation and replacement section learning cottage replacement i'll come back to that in, in, in just a minute but it's 3.6 million dollars over five years so i'm gonna slow down for a second talk about warwick high school and denby high school so Warwick High School was built in 1968. Denby was built in 1965. In earlier versions of the CIP that we presented to you, we had funding back up on the HVAC line and the roofing or replacement line for both of those schools. For Warwick, for the two system replacements, we had about $19 million. We had about $17 million for HVAC and roofing replacements at Denby. So again, that was earlier uh, CIP versions. For this version, we're asking for your approval tonight. Instead of sinking um, a substantial amount of money in just two systems for older buildings. We really want a more comprehensive approach. So for Warwick High School, we're asking for $52.8 million. It's $2.8 million in 23 for the design and then 50 for the construction. So with that $50 million, again, instead of, we will address roof and HVAC, and that needs to be done. But we also could look at technology systems, safety systems, electrical, plumbing, lots of different systems in those schools. It will also give us flexibility to prioritize what we want to want to uh, work on to possibly address the facade, extra facade of those buildings. Um, maybe touch an instructional space, maybe add some instructional space. But again, that fifty million dollars for Warwick gives us a lot more flexibility. It meets our immediate needs of roofing HVAC, but also uh, we can put money into it and extend the life of those buildings substantially. Same story for for Denby. Uh, that's a little further down the road in 2026 we're asking for 2.8 million dollars for design and 48 for construction but it, it, it's the same story it gives us flexibility to address different systems and perhaps the facade and instructional space and then the high school as well so i can move down two lines for the, the buildings in our cip the building section we're asking for 157.4 million dollars over five years and again the first year is 15.3 million dollars not to be excluded from all this talk a lot about buildings, but our, our bus replacements. We have a great bus replacement program. Typically fund about $2 million for bus replacements every year. And working across, we we're asking for $14.7 million over five years, 2.9 in the first year. Uh, I will add that we're expecting about 31 buses next month from our FY21 CIP. And uh, so we're real excited to get those in and add to the fleet. So going through, I do want to uh, add that the work session, there was a request that we make a note that Huntington Middle School is funded in the city CIP. Indeed it is. It's in the CIP that the city council approved last month. 
That's why it's not in, in our budget. It's $40 million. And also, Riverside Elementary School, in earlier editions, there was about $5.9 million for a renovation. We've taken that out and again, redirected some money back towards these renovations. I said I'd come back to learning cottage replacements, and I will now. Since we took the money off of the renovation of Riverside, we added $600,000 to replace the trailers there in 2026. So that's the CIP over five years. It's $172.1 million. And the first year, it's $18.2 million. Um, and that's before you tonight for your consideration. And just want to walk through the next steps. Again, that's the budget before you tonight. There are scheduled um, meetings on the city side. The city manager will recommend her CIP November 9th. Then there are different work sessions throughout the, the winter and into January. Uh, city Council may have four work sessions. They may approve it earlier. That's really up to them and, and the information that they get and what they're comfortable with, uh, when they're comfortable taking action. And then at the work session, we hear from Quadra Strategies. We are ongoing working on a long range facilities master plan for all of our facilities. So that is the CIP and the timeline, and I will be glad to attempt to answer any questions you all have. Thank you, Mr. Sorensen. So at this time, uh, may I have a motion to uh, approve the CIP? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a motion to approve the proposed capital improvement plan budget as presented. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Is there a second? Second. A second from Mr. Hunter. All right, at this time, are there any questions from board members prior to uh, I have just a comment. Oh, yes, yes, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, the comment that I just want to give is thank you all, um, Dr. Parker and your team, for the work that you put in to um, present the um, CIP and also to retool it. I think it was retooled very realistically for what we have in front of us, and I think it's a, it's a nice plan moving forward as we're looking at the schools in our district who need that the attention. So thank you for that. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Ms. Amen. Um, could you just remind us of we switched on the Riverside from the addition to the learning cottages. Was there a, a population shift change that drove that or? There, there, was, there was not a population change. It was really looking at our available resources and the needs of our facilities and prioritizing our resources with those needs. So. Um, again, we put we kind of re put some money in, in the renovations of the, of the high schools, and we thought we could accomplish the same at Riverside by replacing the learning colleges at a cheaper cost than the addition. And the uh, and the addition is still will probably still be needed um, in the future, and hopefully the master plan that's being developed will outline where to prioritize that. Uh, we knew that the uh, systems for these buildings that uh, that we're talking about are though that work is coming up. And it just uh, it just doesn't make sense to replace a roof and a HVAC system in a building that needs to be renovated um, because you're extending the life of the facility for 30 for 30 years, and if system, other systems need to be upgraded, um, and you're just putting a roof and a, an HVAC in, um, and not improving the instructional space, not removing portables, putting a new facade to modernize the facility, new technology, um, we're not necessarily uh, being best stewards of taxpayer dollars, in my opinion. The thought is those are more urgent. They have more time is of the essence. In the involved, yeah. Any other any other questions? Any further discussion? Are right, there being a Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Four. Mrs. Searles Law. Four. Mrs. Amon. Four. Dr. Best. Four. Mr. Ely. Four. Mr. Brown. Four. Motion carries six zero. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. All right. Now we'll move on to uh, section five, which is our reports and information. 5.01 is our monthly school update. Uh, Dr. Parker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this evening, I have uh, several staff who will uh, come, come forward for the um, monthly update uh, on our schools. Uh, this evening, we, as, as typical and, and, um, and has become customary, we'll start off with our COVID-related uh, uh, data and then move into some instructional information that we'd like to share. We also have some new information we, we're going to be sharing with the community tonight um, that, uh, that will be in this presentation and will be in further future communications uh, moving forward after this board meeting. So at this time, I will turn it over to staff uh, to begin the presentation. I believe uh, Mrs. Carlson is uh, kicking us off with COVID metrics. Uh, Mrs. Carlson, are you with, with us, Carlson? Yes, I'm here. Okay, we're, um, we'll turn the podium over to you, ma'am. 
Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending. Uh, as you can see, our transmission rate for Newport News is still in the highest uh, transmission level. We have 172 cases per 100,000 people with a positivity rate of 7.3%. Uh, someone this week had asked me what the positivity rate means. And that is the percentage of all COVID tests performed that are actually positive. And as you can see on the chart, we really want to be lower than 5%. Uh, we're getting there. Our cases have been going down. Uh, as you can tell on the map, there are parts of Virginia that are in substantial, which of course, you know, we would rather be moderate or low, but the, there are areas that show hope. And again, our cases are going down. Next slide, please. So currently we have uh, 1,249 students who are out on quarantine or isolation, and we have 34 staff members. Uh, you know, our number for students, of course, is higher than staff because of the amount of students 12 and under who have not been able to be vaccinated yet. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing that the division is going to participate in is the VISTA program. Uh, VISTA stands for Virginia School Screening Testing for Assurance. We're going, uh, we, we have applied to participate. We're waiting to be matched up with a vendor. Uh, the vendors are going to come into the schools and do pooled testing of any student or staff member with a signed consent form who's agreed to participate in this with the idea of identifying asymptomatic COVID cases to help contain outbreaks. This will be one addition mitigation strategy that we will be using, uh, combining that with our masking, vaccinations, and physical distancing. We plan to start using it in our high impact schools and we would like to also test students involved in extracurricular activities and events such as uh, students who are participating in sports, students who are in band, chorus, show choir, things like that. Again, any student or staff member may opt into the program. We will have a consent form that will be going home with all students. And again, it will be voluntary with the completed consent form. Uh, next slide, please. So again, like I said, this will be done with vendors that will be matched to Newport News by the Virginia Department of Health. Um, the Virginia Department of Education is partnering with VDH, and part of that will be to provide funding for us to purchase supplies that we would need and to hire additional staffing to assist with this. Uh, we are looking to hire a testing coordinator to assist with managing this in our schools. And we will provide the criteria for student testing, which I had mentioned earlier. Coordination of the consent forms will offer a space for testing. Uh, we will continue to implement the mitigation guidance and we will report positive tests as necessary. Uh, another important part of this, of course, will be contact tracing that is currently taking place in all of our buildings by our nurses, our clinic assistants, and by our health services contact tracers who have been hired to assist us with this important task. Next slide, please. Like I said, vendors will do the COVID testing for us. Uh, the swab test will be submitted as a pool. What that means is that there will be a pool of students and or staff that may consist of 10 tests that will be submitted together and that pool will be tested. If the pool test comes back negative, nothing else needs to take place. However, if one, if the pool, excuse me, tests positive, then either each participant will be retested or I learned today 
depending on what vendor we use and what lab runs the tests for us, they may be able to use the pooled sample to identify the individual person who tested positive. Mm. And if, when that occurs, like I said, those resu results will be reported and contact tracing will take place. Next slide, please. Uh, this is something new that I think hopefully will make quite a few people um, happy. Starting immediately tomorrow, Newport News will shorten its quarantine protocol for at unvaccinated students and staff from 14 days to 10 days. So how that is going to affect all of us is anyone who has been identified as a close contact of a positive COVID case will now quarantine for 10 days. Or if a person has been tested for um, excuse me, for COVID, they will remain home waiting for that test result to come back. And of course, they will isolate for 10 days still. And like I said, unvaccinated individuals will quarantine for 10 days. Anyone vaccinated, does considered fully vaccinated, does not have to quarantine. And anyone who has tested positive within the last 90 days also would not have to quarantine according to the CDC guidance. Uh, another thing that has recently changed with the CDC is anyone who is considered a close contact, is it, whether vaccinated or unvaccinated, is encouraged and recommended to receive a COVID test at day five to seven after their last exposure to the positive person. Next slide, please. That's the end of my presentation. Hello. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Ely. I have one question. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> What's the turnaround are. test for the testing? Oh, the turnaround uh, time uh, for is 24 hours. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, Mr. Ely, go ahead. <laughs> uh, thank you for your presentation. Quick question. Um, I got a couple calls from a couple parents over the time of the school being open seeing that their children were quarantined and then took the test and the test come back negative, but they still required to quarantine for a total of 10 days. And the parents stated to me that the children knew if they went to the nurse with these complaints that they would be sent home for quarantine. And she said she found well, out she had four kids home an all negative test and the school said they couldn't come back to after their quarantine period was over well if if it's somebody if it's a student that is sent home who is symptomatic for covid 19 then and they do not have a known exposure that student may receive a negative test or an alternative diagnosis from their medical provider and they may return to school Okay. Again, that's someone who may have COVID based on one or two symptoms. Now, for quarantining, we have changed that from 14 days to 10 days, and we're not offering the option of testing out of quarantine. And that is confusing to people, but again, if, if it's a child who has COVID-like symptoms without a known exposure, they may return with a negative test or with an alternative diagnosis from their medical provider. Gotcha. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Ms. Amy. So I'm just trying to get my arms around these, these two. So if you're a close contact, you cannot test out of quarantine, even if you get a negative test five to seven days after your exposure. Correct? Correct. We, no, we, we are not doing that at this time. But if you were symptomatic and sent home, you could come back with a negative test. Correct. Okay. The, uh, the reason behind that is the, the science on being a close contact and quarantining, the 14 days, which was what we had been doing prior to starting tomorrow, is when a person could then test positive for uh, COVID. 
and the fourth and I know it's confusing the 14 days being longer than how long a person who actually has COVID has to stay out but it's based on the incubation time and again when somebody could then test positive for COVID and we have had that happen okay um and then my other question going back to the group testing the pool testing um it almost it seems redundant i don't know if any student would want to be tested twice two days apart um is there any way we can definitely can request or get with a partner to you know if they're pulling 10 tests to identify it so we don't have to put the kids through two sets of tests or what would cause us to do a pooled test <laughs> the pool testing is what the vista program is offering for uh schools in virginia to offer covid testing it's it's a more cost effective manner at running the test it's more cost effective to run one large pool than again and i and i'm not sure what the number of tests will be included in a pool i think it's but 15. It's cheaper to run one than to run 10. Yeah, it's it's. I think it's fifteen at a in a pool. Okay, thank you. And 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 just so just so you're aware, the um, there are stipulations to receiving the funding from Vista for this. One is we have to do the uh, consent to the pool testing, and the other is diagnostic testing of some of some nature. Um, you, right. We, so you have to have those two. You have to submit because you can't say, oh well, we'll we'll take your money, but we'll just do this. The there, the there are requirements that we actually have to participate fully in the program. Mm -hmm. Uh, to receive the funding that's available to us to be assigned a vendor um, the, the funding necessary to hire staff to run the testing program those types of things so and is that is, is that something that the opt-in will be once and it's good for the year or can parents if they choose to pull the kids out of the consent how will that work uh the testing coordinator will ultimately be over the whole program however each school nurse will be involved in it and assisting with the consent form. So if a parent notified the school nurse and said, I no longer want Nancy to participate in the pool of testing, then that consent would be pulled and Nancy wouldn't, wouldn't participate in the pool of testing any longer. And uh, the, uh, the other news that we wanted to share just to, just for once, um, uh, I know everyone's anxiously awaiting the approval of testing for um, vaccinations for students uh, five, ages 5 through 11. Um, I just received a report from the um, VDH um, yesterday that by the end of the month or early November, uh, they expect to have that um, emergency authorization through. So we should be hearing information uh, no later than early November about uh, getting up and running with, with some level of vaccinations for ages 5 through 11. So. That time is coming soon. Um, again, this testing program here is, is for asymptomatic folks and even vaccinated um, individuals who are asymptomatic maybe maybe um, may test positive. So that we believe Correct. this pool testing will allow us to maintain a safer environment. It's a, just another mitigation strategy to ensure that we can maintain a healthy environment. Um, it's very important at the elementary um, levels right now that we do some, some something like this because they don't have any access to a vaccine. Yeah. And do we envision this being like a one and done? Or are they gonna, like if you would, if you consent to the pool, are you looking at doing it like every week or every other week? What's the commitment there? It's weekly. Yeah, we would determine our pools. And 15. the idea is to test weekly in order to capture someone who could possibly be asymptomatic. May not be the same person. Have COVID. Okay, and will that be made clear yeah. in the consent? Once we have a vendor, once we have the vendor assigned, we, we have to develop an MOU uh, with that vendor where we'll put in the details right. of what our testing program will entail mm -hmm. and what our communication plan will be. So right now we're waiting for that vendor to be assigned and then we'll be in the development stage for the MOU. Mr. Yulia, I believe you have one more question. Just one question. Um, so with this new testing process, children that don't, don't have access to health care, if their parent want to get them tested, would the school system be able to, would that parent be able to say, hey, I want to get my child tested and get them exposed to, to COVID? Well, they, they definitely would have access through this program to, to some level of testing, depending on uh, whether it's pool testing or diagnostic. Um, so I, I guess how we develop the MOU and what's the availability of test kits 
um, which is something else this program provides. They provide individual test kits that you can take home. Uh, we're waiting yes. for our first supply of those. So the I've answer to that question is yes, because we'll have to test, we'll have test kits provided. Because I know all our children don't have access yes. to health care. So I want to make sure, just because I don't have insurance, or right. don't have that access, if I feel like my child's been exposed to COVID, they still have the ability to still get tested right then and there. They don't, they're not put off to the side. And my second question, is there possible that we can get a some data on how many schools have their quarantine far as the, the schools we have, how many schools have quarantined from highest levels to lowest level, if possible? We, uh, we have that because we looked at this before moving to 10 days. We looked at our region, uh, regional school divisions um, because we, they're working with some of the same health departments. And some all health departments are not the same. So, I mean, they're across the state. They have their own um, localities, have their health departments. Some uh, are sticking very sternly with the 14 days, which is, which is, the, which is the optimal. And then some have relaxed to 10 based on CDC guidance. No, no, no. My question was, can I get a list of, far as our schools we have in our division, which schools have quarantined the most from just going on the demographics? Like, say, for oh. instance, um, Discovery STEM compared to Denver Early Childhood. School, the school comparisons. Yeah, school comparisons of what schools have quarantined. I think we we have that data. Am I correct, Ms. Price? Yeah, we do. We have that data. We have that data. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Other, You're welcome. Any other questions? I'll just make one um, one comment just for the, the parents that have contacted me. The, the nuanced point of symptom, I'll call it symptomatic COVID, as you described, that I can get a five, within five to seven days negative test, I can come back to school versus contact tracing, COVID, quarantining. I'm, I'm at home for 10 days regardless. That that nuance um, is lost on the, at least the parents that have contacted me and, and complained. That's yes. been one of the number one complaints is they. I don't understand, I got a negative test, why can't my kid come back to school? So just if there's posters or something we can change on the website, uh, an orientation we can give to parents um, to help them understand this difference, that that would cut down on, um, probably cut down on a number of the complaints that we're getting right now. I agree. It is, it is confusing, so I do agree. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So the next item, we'll move on with our academic, and I think we have an assessment update with Dr. Meglinon. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Dr. Gerald's here. <laughs> Good evening. Um, Chair Brown, Vice Chair Sarles Law, um, board members, Dr. Parker, and our important community. Thank you for the opportunity to share updates related to our um, Newport News Public Schools assessment plan. And I would like to start our presentation this evening by reviewing the U.S. Department of Education Accountability and the Virginia Department of Education accreditation timelines that you have seen previously in previous presentations. Due to the impact of extended school closure, adjustments were made to the federal accountability and state accreditation measures. State accreditation was waived for the 2021 and 2021-2022 school years due to extended school closure. State accreditation resumes in the 2022-2023 school year, and this accreditation is based on school quality data measures that are gathered during this current school year. This information, the information gathered during the previous school year, 2021-2020, sorry, all the 20s get me every time, 2020-2021 school year, serves as a baseline for our work moving forward and was not used to calculate accreditation for the current school year, which was waived by the Virginia Department of Education. This data will be used moving forward as a baseline for our work and will also be used for calculating growth in accreditation measures. Thank you. Our focus remains on providing each learner with quality instruction that is informed by timely and relevant data. Quite simply put, we're focused on student growth. The Virginia Department of Education is requiring the administration of the student growth assessment for students in grades three through eight, PALS for students in grades K through two, and VKRP for our kindergarten learners. Newport News Public Schools is supporting the identification of unfinished learning through diagnostic assessments, such as the reading inventory, which measures students' reading ability and development, while the math inventory will be used to measure what students are ready to learn during their mathematics instruction. 
Though there is expertise in assessment and data at the division and state le level, nothing can replace the expertise of our instructional staff that works with learners daily in gathering data that is formative in nature to inform their work. We will work to combine the data points to identify supports and resources necessary to address unfinished learning and the disproportionate impact of school closure on our most vulnerable learners. NMPS has committed to keeping instructional time our priority and is in the process of administering assessments for the first marking period. Click. Sorry. <laughs> The first marking period of the 21-22 school year is well underway, and we're in the process of analyzing the data that will be used to inform our work and our community. The calendar presented outlines the required assessments for the first marking period. I would like to take time to thank the Newport News Public Schools Assessment Committee. This group committed to the challenging work of developing a balanced assessment plan that places value on diagnostic and formative assessments over repeated summative assessments. Much like we visit the doctor, diagnostic assessments provide relevant data along the way to inform instructional decisions, distribution of supports, and allocation of resources. Next. With our assessment window closing in the coming weeks, you can expect a report on our progress at the next board meeting and the mid-year update on our strategic plan, Journey 2025. Thank you for allowing me to provide you with a brief overview of our work thus far, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have at this time or receive any feedback you might have regarding our plan thus far. All right. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Dr. Darrell. Thank you. So, Mr. Chairman, as part of the, our uh, update for the board uh, and the community this evening, We've had several meetings on uh, school reentry planning and safety planning for Heritage High School and Huntington Middle School. So tonight, we'll just go ahead and uh, brief the board and the community on our updated plan and activities related to the reentry of students and staff to uh, to both of those schools. And with us is uh, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Blow to provide that update. Good evening, Chairman Brown, Madam Vice Chair Searles Law, members of the school board, Dr. Parker, and the Newport News Public School community. We like to provide several updates to you regarding the Huntington Middle School and Heritage High School reentry safety plan. As previously shared, various division, school, and community stakeholders have collaborated over the past few weeks to develop a reentry safety plan and propose timeline for return for the Huntington and Heritage School communities. The following components are included in the plan. Six security officers are assigned to Heritage High School and one security officer is in place for Huntington Middle School. Additionally, a dedicated Newport News Police Department School Resource Officer is assigned to the Heritage and Huntington campus. Upon student return, there will be increased safety searches with metal detection as well as safety drills conducted on the campus. Staff will be provided the opportunity to participate in a series of safety trainings, including the citizen response to active shooter events training, as well as safe school emergency situation modules. Each school's administration team, in collaboration with professional school counselors and student support specialists, will facilitate student town halls and morning meetings to review safety procedures, anonymous reporting tools, and provide students opportunity for discussion and input. Finally, all staff and student wellness supports will continue to be provided through the Newport News Public Schools Office of Student Advancement. And now at this time, Dr. Eleanor Blow will share our proposed timeline for return. Good evening. Displayed on the screen is the timeline for re-entry of Heritage and Huntington staff and students. Following our previous school board meeting, the fall sports did resume and other activities such as band. When the students returned for these activities, we did have members of the Student Advancement Crisis Team present to support our students as they returned for these activities. On October the 11th, 
faculty meetings were held with both Heritage and Huntington staff members to inform them of their return to in-building teaching beginning on October the 14th. Again, members of the Student Advancement Crisis Team were present to provide supports for our staff members as they reacclimated to being back in the building on the campus. Today, October 19th, the final, final plan is being released with a follow-up virtual town hall meeting to be held tomorrow evening, October 20th at 6.30 p.m. To view the town hall meeting, Heritage and Huntington families should check their email as they have received the link via email or they can go to the Heritage or Huntington websites and in the news and announcements section there is a link to join the town hall meeting. There will be doc Dr. Parker along with other guests will be present for this town hall meeting. Prior to students returning to school, each school will host a family open house scheduled for October 21st for Huntington and October 25th for Heritage. As outlined in the reentry safety plan, we have staggered the return of students to the building with Huntington students returning for full day in-person instruction beginning on October 25th. And Heritage students will return for full day in-person instruction beginning on October 27th. Again, we would like to take this opportunity to thank all who worked with us to develop and implement this reentry plan for Heritage in Huntington. This is the work of several departments in Newport News Public Schools, the Newport News Police Department, and the Newport News Emergency Operations Management Center. We are appreciative of their assistance and work for Newport News Public Schools, and we look forward to the return of our Heritage and Huntington students for in-person learning. Thank you. Are there any questions? Yes, Ms. Amon. Um, if anyone cannot make the virtual town hall on the 20th, will that be recorded so they can watch it later? Like if they're working tomorrow evening or something? It is a webinar, so yes, we can okay, record great. it, yes. Mr. Ely. Thank you so much, great presentation. Um, if a child is traumatized from the events that happened at Heritage High School, and plan to not attend, what would be the options for that child? Well, what we, ha we do have in place various supports provided by our student advancement system. So our first response will be to make sure that we're providing those supports for mental wellness for that student and his or her family. We will look at each individual case, but it is our goal to have our students return back. And we hope that through our open houses and our opportunities for families to talk with teachers and with the administration there that they will feel safe and comfortable to return back. We put a lot of work into making sure that we have everything prepared for our students for in-person learning. But we have a variety of supports, not only for staff and for students, so that would be our first um, option to try to support that student through some mental and social emotional wellness supports. But there are options for that, for that child if they choose. I've, experience a PST, PSTD, I can't go back to school right now, they've been seeing therapists, so there are options for that child. If you had that level of um, um, concern with that, we would treat it with in, like any other student who has a um, um, uh, anxiety issue in our schools, and, and, there, and we do have students who have anxiety problems, those types of things. Uh, obviously the first job is to make sure that our, our mental health uh, support is offered. The second will be a student support team meeting would probably be held with the family. Uh, and then also we would, we would also encourage that family to seek some medical support or get a medical diagnosis for that anxiety, which would allow us to provide something like home-based services. Um, so there's a process for getting to that level of service. Um, and if we have any students who, uh, who uh, meet that standard, then we would definitely provide the supports necessary. I just want to make sure we, that it's clear that it is an option. I know it's not for every child, but like I was saying, I was at the reason why I asked that question. I was at the grocery store two days ago, and a lady grandmother came up to me and said, "My daughter experienced PTSD." I asked her, "Did you call the hotline? We have wraparound services, 24 hours. We're partnering with CSB." So she said, "I don't know." I said, "Well, you know, talk with your school principal, your school administrators, and then make the best decision for you." I said, "But I can't answer that question." Right. So that's what I wanted to ask you here tonight, just because she said she'd be watching, would there be options for her child? So thank you so much, Dr. Parker, for the presentation. All right. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
So that concludes the report for this evening. So okay. So that will uh, move us on to 5.02, which is our new revised policies and procedures. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Parker. It's a pleasure to share highlights from five new and revised policies and procedures with you this evening. As you know, one of the major roles, and I better, I'll wait for my support. <laughs> Thank you. One of the major roles of the school board is to set the policy direction for the school division. So we're fortunate to have two board members on the policy committee, Dr. Best and Mrs. Amon, along with a principal from each level, administrators from the Department of Teaching and Learning and the Office of School Leadership, a teacher, two attorneys, and myself as the policy administrator. This evening, I'd like to share new and revised policies and procedures for review in two groups. First are the policies that we are developing to support best practices in the school division. And second are those that are required by new state legislation. And as most of you are aware, we typically begin each policy year by revising our current policies or developing new ones to ensure that we meet the most recent mandates. This first group of policies are not required by law, but work to support best practices in the school division. They include a proposed revision to our current student safety policy and a new procedure that describes our layered approach to school safety. A new policy and procedure on cybersecurity, which is very timely since October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and revisions to our policies and procedures regarding the rent the rental of school facilities and grounds, along with the use of Todd Stadium. Now at your special meeting a couple of weeks ago, I shared revisions that we are proposing to our current policy on student safety to reinforce our commitment to maintain a safe environment every day for our students throughout the school division. So we are revising our current policy on student safety to add the school division's multifaceted layer approach that involves developing appropriate relationships within buildings and among staff and students, ensuring consistent behavioral expectations from students by consistently applying the student code of conduct, developing well-structured staff, student, and family reporting mechanisms, controlling and monitoring building access, using various safety drills required by state law, and maintaining a safe physical environment at all of our schools. Now this layered approach to school safety forms the new procedure to the policy as a framework for school division and community resources working systematically to create positive school environments, to support student well-being, to prevent school violence, and to protect the school community through effective security measures and preparedness planning. Now the layers in the framework will be reviewed each year and updated as needed to reflect lessons learned and best practices researched from other school divisions, particularly in our surrounding communities. The new procedure pulls all of our safety measures together in one place and begins by re-referencing the crisis management plan for each school and our division-wide emergency operations plan. The school plans serve as an operating guide for a wide range of emergencies and responses that are specific to each school's unique characteristics. The plans are audited and practiced throughout the school year. The new procedure also acknowledges that there are internal processes and guidance documents throughout the school division that work to implement the 12 components or layers of our school safety framework. The framework is the major focus of the procedure, which includes a summary of each of the 12 measures that are deployed in our schools. And here is a visual representation of the school safety framework that was shared with you at your special meeting earlier this month. It involves a layered network of safety measures that work together to ensure student safety at all of our schools. And Dr. Parker spoke to each of these 12 components at your last meeting. So to briefly summarize, the framework consists of student behavior expectations, student adult relationships, anonymous reporting, safety drills and procedures, control building access, physical school security, video surveillance, 
visitor access control, random and required searches, social media monitoring, and community reporting and communications. We know that no one safety measure is capable of maintaining a safe school environment for a sustained period of time. So a focus on consistency and training is necessary to ensure effectiveness over time, which is a part of the school safety network as well. And again, a summary of each component is provided in the procedure. And lastly, the student safety policy was updated to require the superintendent to to post the procedure or safety framework annually and to allow the uh, community the opportunity to review the document and to provide input. Our next policy addresses cybersecurity, and as I mentioned earlier, the timing was perfect to propose a new policy and procedure given that October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. The policy focuses on the school division's commitment to protect the school division's digital assets, such as our network, our computers, our data, and staff and student privacy against growing security threats through a comprehensive and robust cybersecurity program. Adopt a policy would also address concerns that are raised by our auditors and insurance underwriters who encouraged us to have a division-wide policy to protect our digital systems and resources. Now the cybersecurity procedure works to protect our digital programs by leveraging widely accepted and efficient security practices that include first designating an information security officer to develop, maintain, and manage the school division cybersecurity program. Second, establish user account access requirements for staff and students through password management and a multi-step login process to ensure that individuals are authorized users. Third, developing and implementing data privacy standards for storing sensitive information. Fourth, formalizing incident response plans to protect against the loss of confidential information or school division intellectual property, and last, implementing school division best practices to advance staff awareness and training programs around basic data security practices. Now the key change to our next policy, which is on the community use of school facility, moves the management of school building rentals from the business office to the office of school leadership so our principals can play a larger role in the initial vetting process. We also took the opportunity to review the rental fee schedule, which did not have a fee listed for using school grounds and fields, so we added a fee that was aligned to the rental of the Todd Stadium grounds that was already in place. And lastly, to make the rental documents more reader friendly, we moved the fee schedule from the policies procedure to form a new exhibit. Now, while the application form to rent Todd Stadium or the surrounding grounds will continue to be obtained by the Office of Athletics and Driver Education for their initial review, the Office of School Leadership will now manage that approval process as well. So we revised the policy and procedure to reflect that change. And our last policy this evening that we will be reviewing is on the prohibition of abusive work environments, and we are revising the policy as a result of recent state legislation. You may recall that a couple of years ago, the school board adopted a policy that prohibits abusive work environments and supports productive and positive work environments for all staff. The state code recently required school divisions to add four definitions to their current policy. So to comply, we revised our policy to add the four required definitions, and we took those directly from the state code. And they are regarding abusive conduct, abusive work environment, physical harm, and psychological harm. So as I conclude my report this evening, I just wanted to revisit our timeline for implementing the five-year review of our 11 policy chapters that contain over 400 policies, many of which also have implementing procedures and exhibits. So as we continue to develop or update the policies that may be required by state and federal law, or those that support the school division's best practices, we will also initiate the review of our next policy chapter, which will be on instruction. 
So in terms of our next steps, the new and revised policies will come before the school board for action at your November 16th meeting. And once approved, the new and revised policies, procedures, and exhibits will be posted on school division websites and disseminated to all schools and public libraries. So this concludes my report this evening. I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. All right, any questions at this time? All right, thank you, Ms. Brooks. Great. Thank you. And now we'll move on to item 5.04, our Bullying Prevention Month update. Oh, sorry, 5.03, our school renaming update. Not to be, not to be forgotten. No, it's okay. I'll keep my uh, report uh, down to about an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Brown, Vice Chair Soros Law, board members, and Dr. Parker. This evening, on behalf of the planning team, I will present an update on our school renaming process. Special Assistant to the Superintendent Tracy Brooks, our Director of Community Relations, Michelle Price, Director of Legal Services, Lynn Wild, and I serve on the planning team for this process. And we've had the pleasure of serving with our dedicated members of the Diversity and Inclusion Task Force around this work. As you know, during the summer of 2020, the school board asked the superintendent to take a look at this topic which school names potentially do not reflect the current NMPS values of inclusion and diversity. The planning group conducted some research and identified several names uh, that warranted further study. Then we placed our school, these school names um, and schools into tiers. During the August 2020 school board meeting, we presented our research and the tiers. On September 15th, the school board voted to proceed with renaming schools in tier one. You can see the schools here. They've been renamed Epps, Nelson, Lee Hall, and Dozier Middle School. Following the school board vote on the tier one schools, Dr. Parker created a community-based task force to guide the renaming process. The task force held its first meeting in November and quickly jumped into the important work of drafting school renaming criteria that was presented to the superintendent and school board after your approval of the new naming and renaming policy, the task force worked collaboratively to develop a process to solicit school names from the community, review the nominations, and narrow the list of suggested names. During the meeting in May of 2021, the school board voted to approve the superintendent's recommendations. And you can see the uh, name changes here. Epps Elementary School is now Stony Run Elementary. Lee Hall Elementary School is now Katherine Johnson Elementary. Nelson Elementary School is now Knollwood Meadows Elementary. And Dozier Middle School is now Ella Fitzgerald Middle School. So we've been busy. Our staff in our plant services and community relations departments work with our sign vendors to design and update school marquees and the cast aluminum letters on our school buildings. You can see pictures here. Our school administrators also work with plant services to update and replace all of all the other references of the former names to include murals, uh, benches, and other signage throughout the building. And, uh, and that all happened at the beginning of the year and uh, happened uh, close to the end of September, actually. School leaders are working uh, with their communities, and a lot of this has been completed. You can see that uh, we have some new logos here on the screen. And uh, we've also worked to make sure letterhead, envelopes, printed materials, and websites have been updated also. We've had a number of ribbon uh, cutting ceremonies. And uh, one of the most recent uh, ceremonies uh, to unveil a new um, mascot was the Ella Fitzgerald Jazz. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very neat and exciting. And actually, uh, Board Chairman Brown mentioned that he was able to see that and take a part in that. So to update you on our task force subcommittee recommendation, our most recent recommendation, I uh, have our historian here, Mrs. Uh, Mary Kay, to, um, from the City of Newport News Historic uh, Site, will present uh, new and additional research because we have, uh, rec we are recommending, excuse me, moving John Marshall Early Learning Center into tier two. Mary Kay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. 
I think we all know who John Marshall was, the third Chief Justice of the United States. A lot of the Newport News schools were named for well-known um, U.S. citizens, presidents primarily. Uh, Marshall is an exception. So I'm not going to go through all the whys and wherefores of his degrees and what he did with his life, but I'm going to address specifically his views on slavery because that is the issue at hand. Uh, Marshall believed that slavery was an evil and he opposed the slave trade. However, he owned slaves most of his life and he had reservations about large-scale emancipation in part because he feared that a large number of free blacks might rise up in revolution. With that in mind, Marshall favored instead sending free blacks to Africa and he founded the Virginia chapter of the American Colonization Society to further that goal. During the 1790s, he was involved in a few cases in which he represented slaves pro bono, often trying to win the freedom of mixed race individuals. In fact, in one case, Robert Pleasance, who he represented, uh, was to emancipate about 400 slaves. Marshall won the case, but the court's holding was later reversed. In 1825, as Chief Justice, Marshall wrote an opinion in the case of the captured slave ship Antelope, in which he acknowledged that slavery was against natural law, natural law, but upheld the continued enslavement of approximately one-third of the ship's cargo, although the remainder were to be sent to Liberia. In his last will and testament, Marshall gave his elderly manservant the choice either of freedom and travel to Liberia or continued enslavement under his choice of Marshall's children. And that was a question of, that particularly interested me and I could not find out what this particular individual decided to do. In any case, um, Marshall's biographer, John Richard Paul, wrote that Marshall owned between 16 and seven household slaves at various points in his life. They declined as he aged. Um, a research by another historian, Paul Frinkelman, however, reveals that Marshall may have owned hundreds of slaves, engaging in the buying and selling of slaves throughout his life. And this particular individual also suggested that Marshall's substantive slave holdings may have influenced him to render judicial decisions in, in favor of slaveholders. Any questions? Any questions on the board? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Kay, for the uh, history behind uh, the former Chief Justice uh, John Marshall. And our, so our next steps, uh, we will be engaging our um, full diversity inclusion task force on the uh, review process that we, we have in place. And then we will be coming back with a recommendation uh, for our superintendent, Dr. George Parker, on how to move forward with John Marshall Early Childhood Center. In addition, we will continue to do the, the work, similar to what we've done the past year and a half, uh, with regards to schools in tier two and tier three. So thank you for allowing us to provide an update. And uh, if there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer any of those right now. All right. Any other questions from the board? Uh, I'll just ask one question, which is uh, once the committee finishes its work, when, what's the anticipated time that the committee will come back to the board to uh, make a presentation? Well, we'll definitely, in, in planning for November, uh, touch base with Dr. Parker on uh, um, our reports, how many reports we have. You know, we're very particular about um, respecting everyone's time. Uh, so we'll leave that up to Dr. Parker based on that. So either November or maybe December. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, Mr. Wright. All right, now we're on to 5.04, Bullying Prevention Month. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening to you, Chairman Brown, Vice Chair, Mrs. Searles Law, board members, Dr. Parker, and to all of our wonderful students, staff, and families that are watching tonight. Uh, as you know, great things are always happening in Newport News, public schools, youth development. Uh, tonight, I have the privilege of providing to you the annual update on bullying prevention efforts across our school division and the community. Oh, I guess I should put, thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll start tonight by reflecting on our intentional and proactive approach to positive youth development and how it supports the Newport News Public Schools Journey 2025 strategic plan. 
Next, I will provide a brief update on our stand campaign. And finally, we will review the Newport News Public Schools bullying prevention interventions and protocols. It's always good to start with the end in mind. The Newport News Public Schools Journey 2025 Strategic Plan includes strategic supports that are closely aligned with our youth development work, especially in the areas of student success, student and staff wellness, and enhanced partnerships. I would like to take a few minutes just to highlight how an intentional focus in these three areas really guides our work, including in the area of bullying prevention. So while we have the systems and processes in place to respond to bullying, our proactive positive youth development strategies, which are designed to promote positive experiences, relationships, and environments for all of our students, remains our primary offensive strategy for discouraging bullying and harassing behaviors in our school community. An integral part of the Newport News Public Schools Journey 2025 strategic plan is the profile of a learner which envisions that every Newport News Public School student becomes an emotionally intelligent, academically prepared leader who is also a resilient, equity-minded, and reflective innovator. Positive youth development strategies that intentionally build skills and traits in students like resilience, positive identity, and self-regulation, which create opportunities for students to lead, serve, and contribute, that work to ensure that every student has at least one healthy relationship with a nurturing adult, and also strategies that make our schools emotionally and socially safe, and which foster belonging and membership, advance our efforts to ensure that students embody the profile of a learner. In other words, positive youth development produces the profile of a learner. And positive youth development continues to be our proactive approach to preventing bullying and harassing behaviors in Newport News Public Schools. As you may know, the month of October is STAND Month, which is also recognized as National and World Bullying Prevention Month. I'm excited to point out that this is the fifth year of the Newport News Public Schools STAND Campaign. So over the past five years, the STAND Campaign has focused on empowering students to lead the bullying prevention efforts in Newport News Public Schools. And all there is, although there is a special emphasis on bullying prevention in the month of October, focused awareness activities that promote kindness, community, and student belonging and membership are conducted daily in our schools throughout the year. Our students, staff, and the community continually work together to increase awareness about the kind of school community we want to have. The number of schools that now apply each year for the coveted STAND Award has grown tremendously, with many schools committing to a continuous year-round focus on STAND principles. STAN also engages community partners who create extraordinary leadership and service opportunities which build skills in our students. And I wanted to point out that Ms. Hampton was one of our guest speakers for our Women in STEM Night. So good to see you. Welcome to Newport News Public Schools. <laughs> um, even in the midst of school closings, our schools continue to offer virtual clubs and activities, as well as a daily focus on social and emotional learning strategies designed to help students develop and maintain positive relationships. It's important to point out that our department has accomplished none of these things alone. Uh, in addition to our students, our youth development leads, activities and athletic directors, school leaders and other school staff have made positive youth development a priority and I personally am grateful for that. Other Newport News Public Schools departments such as Student Advancement and even some of our community partners stand with us regularly in creating opportunities for youth development focused staff development. We are also very fortunate to have a number of community partners who work with us to increase opportunities for students, to improve our skills as youth developers, and to extend the reach of our youth development work beyond our school walls. The CNU Center for Community Engagement continually partners with us to connect CNU students with volunteer opportunities in our schools. And the University of Virginia Youth Next Center to promote effective youth development meets with us regularly to keep us abreast of the most current research and evidence-based positive youth development strategies. Over the summer, we partnered with a number of youth serving Newport News organizations, such as Newport News Parks and Recreation, the Boys and Girls Club, and the Newport News Police Department, Community Youth Outreach Department to form the Newport News Youth Collective. And we're really excited about this group.
The purpose of the group is really to assign our work, to align our work as youth developers, to synchronize our calendars and to make, to be better advocates for students, to empower them and to meet the needs of all youth who live in the city of Newport News. And as always, a number of our churches and other faith-based organizations consistently support our youth development efforts. Because of this support, we are able to offer the experiences you can find outlined in the 2021-2022 Stand Calendar, which is available on the Newport News Public Schools Bullying Prevention webpage. We encourage all students, families, and the community to participate in the remaining recognition activities. Now, although we have a continual focus on creating positive culture in our schools, when bullying does occur, our school staff follows a standard resolution process. Whenever we receive a report of bullying, our bullying reporting and resolution flowchart provides clarity for all stakeholders on how to process a report of bullying behavior. When a report of bullying is received, our practice is that the parent or guardian of all students involved are contacted and an investigation is done. Often what is reported is a form of conflict that cannot be categorized as bullying. Bullying by definition is an offense that is one, aggressive and unwanted, two, repeated over time, and three, occurs when there is a real or perceived power imbalance, such as height, size, popularity, socioeconomic status. So we often have to review these characteristics of bullying to help students, parents, and others differentiate between what is bullying versus a matter of conflict between students. For example, a student may be teased in class one day by another student. These students have never had a problem, but one of them goes home and tells the parent that he was bullied. The parent makes a report. We take the report and investigate it, determine if it was bullying, and then the designated school administrator makes a decision about how to proceed. If it is not bullying, the administrator will determine what the necessary step should be to address the conflict which may or may not result in discipline. If it is bullying, a discipline referral is created and we follow division policy. If it is a crime, we contact law enforcement. If not, we determine the appropriate action for that situation. Both parents are always included in the effort to resolve the issue. Thereafter, all involved students are subsequently contacted to ensure that the bullying report has been resolved. In addition to informing staff each year, students and families receive information about bullying interventions and prevention protocols in the Student Rights and Responsibilities Handbook, which includes definitions, examples, and ways to report bullying. Students, families, staff, and the community can report bullying harassment and other serious concerns anonymously 24 days a week, seven days a week via web form, email, phone, or text message. In addition to reporting systems, there are multiple ways in which we gain insight, including student surveys and informal feedback. This chart shows the, th the three year trend of the total number of bullying incidents reported in our student information system. As you can see, there has been a consistent decline in bullying reports from 89 incidents in 1819 to 35 during the 1920 school year. And I should point out that, that the 1920 counts are, reflect only 119 days of reporting. And then finally, just one report uh, in the student information system for the past year. The National Center of Education Statistics reported a 6% reduction over the past 10 years in bullying uh, in the percentage of 12 to 18 year old students who reported bullying in school. So with the closing of schools and 100% of students attending school online, some were concerned that reports of cyberbullying would increase, but several national studies have demonstra demonstrated that that actually has not been the case. These graphics also show the number of reports of bullying by type that have been captured in our student information system. And in keeping with national trends, the highest percent of reported bullying is consistently among middle school students, which is why we have such great empowerment programs and social emotional learning um, opportunities for our students at the middle school level. Before I close and, uh, and receive any questions you may have, I would like to invite you to participate in a very special Stand Month closing activity. 
On Friday, October 29th, we invite all school board members to join other community partners and other special guests for Stand Together and Read Day. Uh, you'll have an opportunity to read specially selected books on bullying, uh, positive identity, and community to our students in grades K through 12, really K through five. Uh, we will definitely follow up with you and hope that your schedule will allow you to join us. That concludes my report for this okay. evening. I want to thank you for your time and I welcome any questions that you may have. All right. Any questions from the board? All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. And uh, now we will uh, move on to 5.05, uh, the attendance report, 5.06, the membership report, 5.07, construction report. Board members, you've received copies of these reports. Are there any questions? superintendent okay hearing none then now we're on to 5.08 comments by the superintendent dr parker thank you mr chairman <clears throat> i'll start by thanking our staff for uh, such a wonderful job they um, pulling reports we all know how the year can get busy but they really get uh, put a lot of attention to detail to the information that they share with the board and community so i'd like to start with uh, by thanking them for that um and thanking our speakers who came in this this evening to share information and their thoughts around our um, education for our students um, one of the thing that, things that was brought forward, uh, brought to my attention um, recently when speaking to a, a former superintendent, uh, a long-standing superintendent, was that uh, no matter what the meetings are, interviews, he likes to, he always looked for, for individuals to, to speak to students. And if students were not at the forefront of conversation sometimes, especially in public education, uh, sometimes we may be um, uh, a little astray in, in, in our thinking. So mm -hmm. I know we have a lot of business items on the agenda. And we think about a lot of things, but I just want to uh, uh, mention it on the dais that um, we, we commit ourselves to making sure that the decisions we make are in the best interest of students. And, uh, and I always ask my staff to, make, to reflect on that as we move forward with anything that we do. So this evening, I'd like to also acknowledge the work of our student, advance, our student uh, youth development team for, the, for always putting the work of students and encouraging the student culture to be alive in Newport News in such a wonderful way, um, whether it's bullying, whether it's student health, um, and other assets of aspects of their lives, we want to make sure our students are first and foremost in our decision making. Uh, so, with that being said, I'll <clears throat> share a few comments, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, just want to make sure I, I did say students tonight on the dais, and I'm going to make that a, a, a habit moving forward. Um, I will start my comments by uh, sharing some good news this evening. Uh, one, Newport News Public Schools uh, on-time graduation rate increased to 94.5% with the class of 2021 and that's uh continues to be higher than the state average um and uh, we obviously owe that work to a lot of individuals in our school division who are working with our students the class of 2021 faced the unexpected closure of schools during their junior year and successfully adapted to virtual and hybrid learning in their senior year to complete their graduation requirements we're proud of the class of 2021 we missed them already and our graduates are a testament to the hard work dedication and perseverance um, of our students. So congratulations to our students and the Newport News team. Newport News Public Schools was recently awarded a $1.6 million grant from the Department of Defense um, Education Activity. Uh, the grant will expand our dual language immersion program to, the, to students at Denby Early Childhood Center and Katherine Johnson Elementary School. Students in the program will be taught English and Spanish in their content areas. The grant gives us the opportunity to add dual language classes in the northern end of our city and dual immersion instruction is currently offered at Watkins Early um, Childhood Center, Saunders Elementary and Gildersleeve Middle School. This month is National Principals Appreciation Month and on behalf of Newport News, I'd like to thank our principals and assistant principals for their commitment to, to students and staff. Uh, as a former principal myself, I know firsthand how challenging and rewarding the job of being a principal uh, can be. So special thanks to our principals for the, for the work that they do and our assistant principals for the work they do in our school division. October is also Disability um, History and Awareness Month. Throughout the school division, we're encouraging and celebrating the contributions and history of people with disabilities and increasing uh, public awareness and rights of people with disabilities. Please visit our website for a variety of resources to celebrate and recognize Disability History and Awareness Month. This is a National School Bus Safety Week, and tomorrow a school bus trans and tomorrow is School Bus Transportation Employees Appreciation Day. 
And we can also say that after this, the start of this year that we need to thank every transportation person we find uh, and, and, and future transportation person we find uh, with the uh, shortage of bus drivers that we have. So we really appreciate the hard work our drivers uh, have done and, uh, and also the work of the, the leadership in uh, transportation and smoothing out some of our transportation routes since the start of the school year. I want to acknowledge and thank the professional dedicated staff in our, in our transportation department. Uh, they support our students in a unique way um, and, and our school division as a whole. And finally, I'd like to remind all students and parents that schools will be closed for students on Tuesday, November 2nd. Our teachers and staff have been working tirelessly over the past several weeks. And as a small gesture of appreciation, I'm designating November 2nd as an e-commute day for our employees on that day. Um, as we know, uh, that is an election day, so they can get out and vote and also uh, uh, commute electronically. So please enjoy the work from home on that day and take the opportunity to vote if you, um, if you haven't done so already. And Mr. Chairman, that concludes my reports for this evening. All right. Thank you, Dr. Parker. We'll now move on to item six, which is another opportunity to hear from the public. Uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any cards? No, sir. All right. There being no cards, then our next board meeting is November 16th. You all have a great night.